incredible. Well, welcome again this morning. It's a blessing to be here. Um, <clears throat> to come into this place and um, leave the world outside, the crazy world is getting crazier every day. And we were here on Sabbath and... I guess it was later Sabbath and didn't maybe even realize, most of us, what was going on in the world that was going to turn it upside down a little bit. But uh, thankfully, we know who reigns. Amen. We know how the story ends. And we, that God is ultimately, his remedial will will prevail. Amen? Amen? So this morning, as you can see on the screen... I want to consider the idea of what does it look like, or the answer to the question, what does it look like to love what God loves? Okay? So you can, you can give me a thought or two, but that's the question. What does it look like to love what God loves? Could we summarize it in a word? Any thoughts? Could we summarize that in a word? What does it look like to love what God loves? Peace? Peace? Yes. Good? Extraordinary? Extraordinary. God, the God the Father? In a word. How about... Did I miss somebody? Obedience? Obedience? What does it look like to love what God loves? How about Jesus? In a word, could we say that Jesus looks like what it looks like to love what God loves? I think so. If we go to um, the book of John, John, or I'm sorry, Psalms first. Got these backwards, did I? No? Okay. This is a messianic quote. This was the scripture reading. So this is looking forward to when Jesus would be on the earth in his words. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. This word delight comes up all the time in the Bible, especially in the book of Psalms. And so... Let's go, to, let's go to the other passage, John 8, 29. Um, this is Jesus speaking. And he who sent me, the Father, is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. So what does it look like to love as God loves? It looks like Jesus. Because Jesus did what pleased his Father. This is the language of love from the heart, not language of an obligatory, at an obligatory level or a theoretical level. Let me read, oh, let me give you one more here. Whoops. Here we go. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desire of your heart. Here's another one. Trouble and anguish have overtaken me, yet your commandments are my delight. I want to read a few other passages from my notes here. See if you can notice a trend as we think about loving as God loves. Psalms, this is almost all these are from the book of Psalms. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Now the word delight, here's some synonyms. Enjoyment, happiness, joy, and Glee. Delight yourself. Be joyous in yourself, also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desire of your heart. Psalms 1-2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Psalms 119. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Again, Psalms 119. Make me walk in the paths of your commandments for I delight in it. Psalms 119 again, and I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. This idea the, the author here is trying to get across is 
that he delights in obedience to God. He delights in being in the presence of God and meditating on God's law and God's will for his life. Psalms 119 again, trouble and anguish have overtaken me, yet your commandments are my delights. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is in my delight. Again, to love as God loves, we must delight to be in the presence of God and to be faithful to God and to be obedient to God. Isaiah 58, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a what? A delight. The holy day of the Lord, the holy day honorable and shall honor him not doing your own ways nor finding your own pleasure nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth. This word comes up over and over and over in scripture and again, especially in Psalms. And this idea of what does it look like to, to love as God loves, well, it looks like you and I delighting in God's word, delighting in meditating on his word, delighting in spending time with him, that it is a delight, that it is a joy, not obligatory, not theoretical. This is the language of love. This is the language of obedience from love. This is not the language of obedience to love, right? We work from, we work from the love of God, not to the love of God. Not a grumbling, slavish, halting, irritable, petulant, sulky, crabby love, but a happy, pleasant, cheerful, willing, freely giving love. Jack, you mentioned earlier about someone that you had been in company of that were trying to live sinless. And they were grumpy and they were irritable or they, you, know, they, you gave an, an image of someone who was um, not pleasant. And I think of where a person can be when they come to they come to the Lord in a, um, how do we want to say it? They come to the Lord in a um, obligatory manner or a cultural manner. Well, my friends are doing it, then um, I might as well go. At some point in time, you're going to appear like you're sucking on a lemon. But when you are, when you are delighting in the Lord and you are delighting in his law and in his word, you will be cheerful and pleasant and happy. If you love someone, you enjoy pleasing that person. You enjoy spending time with that person. It is no different with our Father in heaven. That if we love him and we profess to be his followers, that we will delight to speak of him. We will delight to spend time with him. Many believe that they come to or work to God out of fear and trepidation to earn his love. When in reality, God's love is always perpetually flowing out to the universe and he is anxiously waiting for us to accept it, experience it, and redirect it. That's what it looks like to love what God loves. Only love evokes love. Only love draws love. Only love freely given can draw love freely returned. Ellen White says it this way in the book uh, Youth Instructor. Love returned, that is love returned to God from us, love returned makes glad the heart of Christ. Did you hear that? When we are delightful in the Lord and our lives reflect that the love we return to him makes his heart glad to love what God loves is to find yourself in union with God at the heart level not just at the cultural level 
oh, I was raised a Christian. I live in a fourth generation Christian home. I was born into it. Everyone else is doing it. It seems right. My friends are there. This is a cultural relationship. This is a theoretical understanding of who God is. This is someone who sees God at a distance. I know who he is. But God wants us to come to the place where we see him and experience him at the heart level. I see him. I know him. Now I want to please him. I delight in service and obedience to him. What is the highest form of praise? Obedience. Obedience. I am in a marriage and I love my wife and I am faithfully obedient to her. I just ask her. <laughs> Moving on. If we come to the place where we love what God loves, then what would be true in the opposite? We would hate what God hates. Am I right? We would hate what God... Does God hate war? Does God hate suffering? Yes. Does God hate... Abusive relationship, yes. God hates anything that causes pain and suffering to his children. You know, we think of situations where we might be involved in or we know of where someone's estranged from their children. And it's difficult. But you don't hate them. You hate the situation or the, pl the place that they are in that's causing the estrangement. God is no different. God is no different. Here's the text. Romans chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Now, do you notice what it doesn't say? It doesn't say, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against men who practice ungodliness and unrighteousness. Does God love those that are living in an unrighteous lifestyle? Of course he does. And here in Romans chapter 1, we see that God, his wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. In fact, it says there, to finish the, the verse, let me go to it, Romans chapter 1. It says, um, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So what is God's wrath revealed against? It's the actions, not the people. Now, if you live in that lifestyle and you refuse to listen to the voice of God, you will suffer the consequences of holding on to sin and holding on to unrighteousness. People so identify with unrighteousness and evil, they suffer the consequences of God's wrath. And by the way, just as an aside, God's wrath is primarily his withdrawing his presence from a person, people, or nation. And when God withdraws his presence, is there a vacuum? There is no vacuum because there is another who will fill it. That is the wrath of God. Romans 7.18 speaks of this struggle that we have with our fallen nature and our desire to be um, in this place that God wants us to be, that is that we love what God loves. Romans chapter 7, Paul speaking, says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me. In other words, I have my own will, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do I do not do, but the evil I will to do, that I practice. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then what is the next verse? I thank God. Who delivers him? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. So how is it that we come to the place that we love what God loves, 
and that we see others through that lens. Is it possible? It is not possible within ourselves. It is impossible. It is impossible for us to love as God loves apart from him. That should be scripture 101. But unfortunately, because of our fallen nature, we often try and do for ourselves what we cannot do. And in the process, we misrepresent God. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, remember, he goes off to pray, and he comes back, and he finds the disciples sleeping. And what does he say to them one of the times? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So there we have our problem, right? When we rely on the flesh, meaning our own will, our own fallen nature, our own desires, not the desire of God, we will encounter problems. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is, you could almost describe it, as a civil war between our ears. We all know this experientially, that there's this battle that goes on where we want to, we speak of wanting to do the will of God and, and be obedient to him, but then we have this fallen nature that has a propensity or a leaning to oppose that, to go the other way. We are, you could say, Villains and victims at the same time. Let me go to the next slide. Psalms 45. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness in the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness. Again, again this is, I meant to, play, to show you this right after the Romans 1. What does he love? He loves righteousness, which comes from delighting in the Lord and being in a relationship with him. He loves righteousness or right doing and hates wickedness and unrighteousness. And why is that? It separates us from him because we're, when we practice unrighteousness, we're telling him what? I don't want to hear it, right? Remember when you were a teenager and you told your parents, maybe quietly, I don't want to hear it. I'm going to do my own thing. Well, we might be adults, but we act in the same way with our Father in Heaven often, or we are, we are susceptible to that. But God wants us to come to the place where we love what He loves and we hate what He hates, which is unrighteous behavior that separates people from Him and causes pain and suffering to His children. Apart from him, it is impossible to love what God loves. C.S. Lewis said it this way, No man knows how bad he is until he tries to be good. Right? Jack, you were talking about this. Grit your teeth, someone you knew. Grit your teeth and I'm going to do it. I'm going to be perfect. I'm going to be sinless. Not going to happen. Apart from God in your life. And when you, when you come to that place where you love as God loves, you will realize that there is nothing good within you, and you do not have the ability to love as God loves apart from him. It doesn't exist. It's impossible of our own devising. So we want to look to Jesus and say, I want to be as he is. I want to be one with him. What does John 17 say in Jesus' prayer? That they may be one as you and I, Father, are one. This was, this was the ultimate desire of Jesus, right? That we would be one. Here it is, verse 21. That they all may be one, all meaning, by the way, everybody, not just those that are sitting in church. Everybody they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So what is the ultimate desire of God? To be one with you. And when you are one with him, it will be reflected 
in your actions. Your actions will be righteous. Your actions will be holy and will be pleasing to God that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me I've given them that they may, they may be one just as we are one. Think about that for a moment. God desires that you would be in a relationship with him so close and intimate that it would be equivalent to his relationship with the son. That's what the text is saying. Wrap your head around that. I'm thinking of a quote from, um, I think, Patriarchs and Prophets, the book, where she says that it was Satan's attempt to separate us from God for eternity. But in the cross, in the life of Christ, in what he has done for us, we are more closely united to him than we would have been if the earth had not fallen, if we had not fallen. More closely united to him. That we, and then she uses these words that I love. This is one of my favorite passages. That we are bound to him for eternity. We are bound to him for eternity. Now, does that start then or can it start now? It can start now. That is God's desire. Jesus said, I come to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. That doesn't mean stuff. In fact, probably for the most part, it doesn't mean stuff at all. Rose said it. Peace. Peace I give you. Many different blessings that God gives us. Health, whatever, whatever he deems it is best for me or you, he wants to pour out, Right? The Bible says, if we were able to receive it, that is God's desire. That is his heart. I want to be, look to Jesus and say, I want to be as he is. I want to be one with him. There's another passage. Thinking of this oneness, Philippians 2, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Let me go to that for a moment because I want to read Sometimes I can't fit the whole passage on there. Philippians 2, Ephesians, Philippians 2. Okay, so I'm going to read. So what I have up there says, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Okay, what does that mind, what does it look like? Well, we talked about loving as God loves. Therefore, verse 1, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy, Paul is saying here, be like, by being like-minded, again, this oneness, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. I almost hear John 17, 21 in there. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. Again, what is this mind? that he's calling us to let this mind be in you, which was in Christ. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. What's another word for lowliness? Humility. Lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. What is it like to let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus? Look to each to others and hold their interests higher than yours. And then verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. There again is practical understanding of how it is that we love what God loves. One more. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. What is he saying here? What is Ezekiel trying to say? That you have a stony, hard heart. You can have. You are susceptible to have a stony, hard heart. In other words, that you are not loving as God loves, but God said, I want to put a soft heart into you. So that you see as I see. So when you walk by the way and you see one, someone down on his luck, as it were, 
that you see him or her as God does. And you don't just say, be blessed and go on your way. You think to yourself, what can I do? Because you are, when you claim Christ, the hands and feet of Christ on this world. That is what he's calling us to. A heart for what God loves. No longer a temptation for the world. No longer a temptation for the world. Would you can abide in Christ when you come to this place that you love as God loves and you hate what God hates, you hate unrighteousness, you hate what God hates. When you come to the place where you love what God loves, will this world be a temptation to you? Will the things of this world be a temptation to you? Were the things of this world a temptation to Christ? Was Christ tempted? Yes. Yes. Will you be tempted? Yes. But will it be a temptation to you if you're in that place to love what God loves and you're in that place of delight in being obedient to God? No. No. The analogy I like to think of for those of you that are multi-generational Adventists, or maybe not, is if you walked by a a party, say on the beach, and there was a fire and there was a spit and there was a pig on the spit and they were turning it slowly over the fire, would that be a temptation to you? No. Anybody that would be vegetarian or or vegan, um, it would not be a temptation to them. That's the idea. That doesn't mean there aren't other things that can't be a temptation to us. But if we're in that place that God wants us to be, to be one with him in heart and in mind, not theoretical, the things of this world will do what? Grow strangely dim. That's where we need to be. That's where we desire to be as Christians. Bonnie. We can come to the point where we hate sin. We should come to the point where we hate sin. And why is that? Because sin destroys. Sin kills. Sin causes suffering. Look at the world that we live in. Separation from the Father. Which is, right, the results of being separated from our Father. That's right. That's right. Go ahead. What is it, she's saying, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? In other words, lose his eternal salvation. So I want to just leave you with that simple message today. That as we go about our lives, that we would come to the place where we delight to do his will. Where we delight in obedience. In fact, obedience isn't a good word is it? It sounds in our vocabulary like do that or else. But we know it's not that way. That we come into that oneness with God, that we do his will out of joy, out of love for what he has done for us. Not to earn, but to express. Amen? Because we love him for what he has done and continues to do and wants to do in our lives. So I'm going to leave you with that simple thought. Consider that as you go through the week to come. Am I in a place where I love what God loves? Am I in a place where I see others as he sees them? Did Jesus touch the leper? He did. Am I in a place to love what God loves? bow our heads. Father in heaven, we just thank you for the life of Christ that sets the example for all of us. That when we think about 
what a life looks like to love what God loves in spite of the world we live in, that we can look to Christ as our example and we can lift him up to others and we can experience the joy that comes from a life centered, focused on him. Be with us, Father, as we go from this place. Fill us with your spirit your Holy Spirit, Father, that we might receive the new heart, that we might love as you love, and in the process, that love will spread out from us to others, and others will see you through us and be wooed and be drawn to you. In the end, Father, in the end, all the glory to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Closing hymn. 309. Let's all stand as we sing our closing hymn.
Father in heaven, as we bow again before you, we just thank, thank you for your faithfulness. Ask, Father, that you would help us, empower us to surrender all to you. To give all to you, Father, is a, is a small thing in return for what you have given to us. Please attend our steps, Father. Guide and direct us in all of your ways as we go from this place. That you might be glorified in some small way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.